Hello and welcome or welcome back to Fancy a Blether podcast. I'm your host Kirsty Taylor and today you have tuned in to our monthly Stories of Scotland episode. Often these stories are taken like from faraway history and um, particularly delving into like Scottish folk- folklore stories. However, we are doing something a little bit different this week and it just felt fitting because the fringe is not long over. Um, for people that don't know what I'm referring to, I'm referring to Edinburgh, Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And I thought, you know, being that we are the city of festivals, why not delve into the history behind the Fringe Festival and how it came to be, which honestly was really fun to research. I love finding out things like this. Um, yeah, so I think it's going to be a really fun one. I'm excited to share all the history with you. And let's hop right into the intro. Hello, 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 everyone. I have missed you. I don't know if I've missed a week or not. Oh, potentially. Sorry about that, guys. No, maybe two. Ooh. Double oops. Sorry, life has been hmm, hectic. The end of the fringe really put me through a number. Let me just say that. There was just so much happening, working two jobs, particularly when one of them is in education. <laughs> and one is like a festival with totally different sleep schedules for each job. It was a lot, especially because they're both pretty so, well, not, one of them was pretty social and adjusting to like a new school, new routine, everything. There was a lot going on. Let's just say that. A lot of fun things going on though, I must add. I did have an incredible month. I just, I needed some time to recalibrate myself. I just got back from being at my parents for the weekend and honestly that was the real recalibration was like going home and enjoying my mum's food and our neighbour's cat and just reading in the sun and lying down and chilling, watching TV, going for a walk with my dad, eating brambles, great time, can't complain. Um, So let's just let's just get into it guys um small wonder of the week um is lists are we surprised no because i'm pretty sure in the past one of my small wonders of the week was organization well now it's lists i love a list honestly sometimes i love a list too much many many a therapist has told me that but there's just something about a list that hits different something about taking stuff off of a list that just feels so wonderful so amazing so i'm shouting out lists um then our gem of the city this week is a place I tried recently with some friends I believe it's called Bonnie and Wild and it is in the top floor of the St James Centre and it's kind of like a marketplace um with different stalls of food and I had the um I don't remember the name of the stall but I it had chai mein at it and I had some spring rolls that were incredible my friends had the pizza and really liked it um so I would recommend giving that giving that a a look because um it was pretty cool and then for my um korean essential sticking with the food theme i'm trying out mint ice cream which you're probably like korean isn't that all about being cozy why are you eating ice cream something about eating ice cream is comforting and cozy i don't know what to tell you especially mint ice cream preferably with no chocolate chips because i am the girl that doesn't like chocolate sorry not sorry i am who i am take me as i as i come or something whatever is people say so that is my korean essential right now and i am now gonna read you this week's poem which is a fun one it's one i wrote myself and um, inspired by by my month of august and um the wonderful people that make August so great every year and make the fringe so great every year and have made my August great every fringe I've worked, which we're now going on four fringes, not in a row, but I've done four all together and I've made some great friendships and memories at all of them. And I wrote this poem for them. So this is this is for all of them. They know who they are, I'm sure, by listening to this. Um, and it's called Angels of August. Angels of August, they flock from near and far to all come together to celebrate a whole range of art. You won't find their face on the, faces on the posters or their names in the speeches, but without them, the show won't run. 
They greet you with a smile, answer questions, the unofficial tour guides of the city. After hours, they console and celebrate each other. They form memories that last a lifetime, friendships that get them through this season and beyond. They bond over the moments of kindness and oh, so many moments where they receive far less. They laugh together, they cry together, they grow together and they go to shows together. For you, the shows might make the fringe. For me, the angels of August make the fringe. So yeah, like I said, it's my own poem called Angels of August. Um, you can find it on our newly rebranded social media, Stories and Stanzas. Um, the Instagram handle is at stories and underscore stanzas. The website is storiesandstanzas.com and I'm going to be posting poetry there. I'm excited to share some writing with the world again. Um, and that is that is this week's poem. Now let's delve into the history of the Fringe. Okay, so for this week's Chart of the Week, I am shouting out Capital Theatres because, um, well, this is literally all about theatre, isn't it? Well, like the arts. So I thought, why not shout out um, a theatre charity? So Capital Theatre is Scotland's largest theatre charity and they exist to inspire a lifelong love of theatre. Um, in order to donate and make a difference today, you can head to their website, capitaltheatres.com. Um, they reach over 15,000 people through their charitable work and want to continue to inspire a lifelong love of theatre in everyone. And you can help out by donating what you can today. So you can go and donate. You can also support the King's Theatre, which they are in the process of transforming. And you can watch their film, which features the panto star Grant Scott to find out, Stott, sorry, to find out more about all the changes that they're making at the King's Theatre. And other ways you can support them is by giving corporate support, being a member or um, dedicating a seat. You can also become a patron or leave a legacy. If you want to support relaxed performances, then you can do that on their website as well. In 2019, over 1,400 people of all ages enjoyed their relaxed performances adapted to create a supportive atmosphere for everyone, including people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. And that creates a space where they can be themselves and enjoy the performances in a way that suits their needs. So like I said, to find out more about them, just head to capitaltheatres.com. Okay, I am so excited to talk to you guys about the Fringe Festival and its history because I... I think the Fringe has been in my life for as long as I can remember. Like I grew up going to the Fringe every August for honestly like I, as long as I remember existing in the world. And if I wasn't going, my parents were going. My mom grew up here, so she grew up like being aware of the Fringe and going to shows and stuff sometimes. And my parents go every year still, and I have worked it four times and uh plan on hopefully working it more and I just think there's something so amazing and so special about the fringe and how it accepts art of all kinds and it gives like a real platform to different creatives that don't have the space in the world normally and I just I really love it so yeah so Edinburgh Festival Fringe a little bit about it well a little bit this whole episode's about it and um, it began in 1947 and it is known as the biggest arts festival in the world. Um, it is often said that the population of Edinburgh triples um, in the month of August because of everyone flocking here to the Fringe Festival. However, is that entirely, entirely accurate? Number, I don't know. Like, does it really triple? I don't know. But the city is buzzing in August. Ask any locals. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I personally obviously love it. Um, it is a three week long festival, but typically people will just consider it the month of August, but it doesn't actually run for the whole month. But obviously there is setup time and there's takedown time. So it began in 1947 because eight theater groups, six of which were Scottish and two that were English, turned up uninvited to the Edinburgh International Festival. These theater groups were Glasgow Unity Theater, Christine Orr Players of Edinburgh, 
Edinburgh People's Theatre, Edinburgh District Community Drama Association, Pilgrim Players, Edinburgh College of Art Theatre Group and Manchester Marionette Theatre. And the groups operated totally independent of each other with no support structure at this time. Um, the Edinburgh International Festival that they showed up to uninvited was created to celebrate and enrich European cultural life after World War II. So other people saw this and saw the success that these theatre groups were having existing on the, the outskirts of the festival and decided to get involved too. So each year more and more performers began to follow suit. In 1948, Robert Camp, who was a playwright and Scottish journalist, wrote, Round the fringe of official festival drama, there seems to be more private enterprises than before. I'm afraid some of us are not going to be at home during the evenings. And from there, the name of the fringe has stuck ever since. So in 1958 was when things kind of took a turn to being a little bit more organized. So the Festival Fringe Society was born and the Festival Fringe Society exists to have a central box office. Um, they provide lots of information, artists and support to artists and tourists. And they publish the official Fringe program with all of the shows of the Fringe within it, which is a real, a real long read. If, you, if you've ever seen one, you know what I'm talking about. And to this day, the, the most important thing about the society is that they do not vet the Fringe program. They allow shows to come from all places in the world with all different stories and all different um, mediums of performance. Um, they don't ever audition people, I suppose, to, for shows. It's very much a, an all is welcome policy, which is something they've kept since 1958. Um, the shows of the Fringe Festival often happen in pop-up or non-traditional venues throughout the city. You'll see many places like pubs, libraries, lecture theatres, um, you name it. I've probably seen it turn into theatres for the month of August. And then obviously afterwards you see the takedown of everything, everything which is so sad. Um, the Fringe Festival is also a place where so many people have had their big break. For example, the iconic Graham Norton, one of my favorite people in the world, um, ha got his big break at the, at the Fringe Festival with the show. And um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge actually premiered Fleabag there. It didn't actually do that well at the Fringe, but obviously he has become the phenomenon that it is today. Ryan Atkinson got his, his big break at the Fringe and the iconic, legendary Billy Connolly was also discovered at the Fringe, one of his first performances that really took off was his him performing at the Fringe Festival. Um, something really interesting that I discovered when researching is this is that one of the most unexpected attractions of the Fringe in 1999 was a preview of the world's first mobile telephone. So it was a Nokia 7110E and it used the Orange network to access the internet. Um, through wireless application protocol technology. I don't really know what that means, but like I guess kind of like Wi-Fi nowadays. And apparently the access was exclusively to the Fringe's website event listings and with production models in October having fuller internet access. So basically people at the Fringe got to like try the, fr the mobile phone for the first time with the internet to use the Fringe's website. Mad. So cool. Um, the Fringe began, obviously, with those eight companies and then became many other companies doing their own thing. But now when you talk about Edinburgh Fringe Festival, you'll often hear people here talk about the big four. So the big four companies are Assembly, Pleasance Edinburgh, Gilded Balloon and Underbelly. So Assembly was first born to the Edinburgh Fringe in 1981 when its founder took on Assembly rooms to host several shows. Assembly is now obviously one of the big four. It has multiple venues throughout the city, including the assembly rooms, which is where it first began its journey. And um, Pleasance Edinburgh was born in 1985 with two theatres facing into a deserted courtyard come car park in the eastern end of Edinburgh's old town. Pleasance Edinburgh now obviously still exists. They now have three venues. They recently took on Edinburgh International Conference Centre in the last few years. As one of their venues, they have the Pleasance Dome and then they have the Pleasance Courtyard. And um, I've seen some really amazing shows there. 
Gail de Balloon was born just a year later in 1986, where it hosted seven shows a day in one studio theatre. And the Gail de Balloon has gone on to become a very different community, um, different, what's the word, not community, um, have a very different culture since then. They actually ran shows all year at one point, pre-COVID, and had a venue that was open all year round and have multiple venues throughout the city, hence why they're also one of the big four. And interestingly, one of the big four didn't actually open its doors until 2000, so a lot later than the other three, um, and that's Underbelly. And Underbelly first opened its doors in 2000 in Cowgate with four shows, which kind of makes sense why they now have theater that is an upside down cow. Um, they, they have an iconic theater that is an inflatable upside down cow that people perform within. Um, they have venues at George Square and in other places in the city. So, yeah, that's a little bit about the Fringe and how it all came to be. I do want to shout out, like, my favorite shows I've ever seen at the Fringe. So, one show that I grew up going to all the time that I absolutely adore is um, Mervyn Stutter Pick of the Fringe. It's a great way to, like, go and see lots of different acts and figure out if you actually want to see more of any of them and Mervyn Stutter has been in the fringe for so long that it's almost like part of part of the experience to see him because he's such a core crucial part of the fringe like he's been in the fringe not since the beginning but for but for a very long time um this year I saw possibly one of my favorite shows I've ever seen called Birthmarked by Brooke Tates Brooke Tate sorry and it was insane amazing the best show I've ever seen in my life like honestly I don't have words for how moving that show was um I could rave about it for the rest of my life like there's too much to say it was so well put together it's like gig theater with a really incredible empowering message and just so well done um just everything about it was perfection so I'm hoping that it either comes back next year or it like goes places because I really think everyone should see that if they're given the opportunity. Um, I when I was younger, I saw a really good show called The Boy with Tape on His Mouth. I don't know if they still do that, but that's really fun, interesting show. If you like something a little bit different, I really love that. I'm trying to think what other ones I saw this year. This year I saw um Dom Chambers. Um, I think it was what was his show like Deck of Cards or something something like that but I really loved it like that was really good it was like he's a magician but there was comedy elements and it was just like a feel-good easy watch really enjoyed um I worked one show that was amazing I have to shout out African Cirque was amazing it's kind of like um a Cirque du Soleil but an African version of it with like African culture mixed in and it was so well done and incredible and those are probably my top friend shows I've seen like over the years I think I'm trying to think if there's any others. I've had like near celebrity run-ins, which is fun. Like um, Irvin Welsh went to my work the day after. My only day off, honestly, the year I was working there. Um, because I was working Train Spotting, which actually that's a really good show, Train Spotting live. And um, very immersive, very full on, but so good. Um yeah, that was sad. It was like literally my one day of not working there that he was there um and then I had like a I suppose I met Graham Norton but not really Graham Norton was going was at a venue that I worked at and he was going up to the other venue it was all part of the same venue I guess but there was like multiple theaters in it and um he was in one show and he was leaving to go to another show and I was like oh perfect I can go and help seat that show upstairs but as he was leaving as that show was going to go in for seating my show that I was doing downstairs that I was on myself because it was a smaller theater that one was coming out so I had to exit flyer and I was so sad because I was like oh no like because I'm a big Graham Norton fan and I was like this is so devastating so I begged my manager to let me go upstairs and exit flyer that theater and he was like you're not supposed to have a break and I was like I honestly I don't care I don't want my break like I need to meet this man but then he came out with the whole audience because I guess like why not but he didn't, didn't want to be recognized it was like between seasons of recording his chat show so he had a beard and the season before he hadn't had a beard and like a hat on he was clearly trying to like not which I really respect like he didn't want to take away from the artist on the stage which like fair play and um, 
but I was really hoping he'd come out like first or last so I could like be like oh my god I love you on your vision which everyone's like why would you say I'm good because it's unique it's original and it's true um he came out with a whole audience so I just had to give him an exit flyer and he kept walking away out of my life and that was my my celebrity sob story one time so to this day it has been my mission that one day I will meet Graham Norton and have an actual conversation with him it's the only celebrity I ever want to meet and speak to I don't really care about the rest like I don't know I'm not really like one for talking to celebrities but yeah there you go and obviously the fringe has now become like a worldwide phenomenon and you can find fringes in like different countries all over the world you can work the fringe circuit um you can like go work it in australia there's one in hong kong there's fringe in brighton there's fringes like everywhere so i just think it's so cool one interesting fun thing and if it wasn't for those eight theater companies back in 1947 taking a risk then we wouldn't have the festival we have today so there you are and that pretty much wraps up the Stories of Scotland episode. Obviously, these episodes are always shorter, so. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, as I said earlier, you can check us out on Instagram at stories and underscore stanzas. Check out our website, storiesandstanzas.com. On TikTok, we're just stories and stanzas. And uh, have a good week, and you'll hear from me next week, the guest again. Thank you. Bye.